This is the Literary Licensed Podcast with your hosts, Vicky Ray, John Wilson, and Keith Shorgo. Discussing book to screen and everything in between. Coming at you from the UK and USA. They keep it real. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Welcome to the Literary License Podcast. I am your co-host, John Wilson, and joining us is my other fellow co-host, Keith Shago. Hello. Say hi, Keith. Hello. And Vicky Ray. Hey, guys. So today we'll be exploring the novel and the film The Exorcist, but before we move on to that, why don't we um, each talk about something that we have an interest in that we're either viewing, watching, or reading. Um, Keith, would you like to let us know what you've been up to lately? Yes, I've been watching the Netflix show, The Fantastic Interiors, which is kind of like, they show like people's houses that are like quite normal from the inside, but then you go inside and they're like fantastic interiors. And there's like, for instance, there's a person like doing a houseboat in London and you see, and it, it's quite interesting because you see the process of that. Meanwhile, intercut with it, it'd be two other places around the world. And it'd be like a police officer who's in Georgia and you go into his house and it's basically all set up like a horror museum. So he has wow. like all these fantastic stuff from horror films and stuff like this. And then there's, you know, then there are people who do brightly color things or things that shouldn't work, but do work. And then there's some really stuff like um, this woman who has a house all interior is totally pink and she dresses nothing pink. So she looks like she's living in a uh, gigantic vagina. So that's a bit disturbing. <laughs> But <laughs> this, is, this is my home, and here's Alabia. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this. My name is Clitoris. <laughs> but it was, but it was. I mean, but it, it's quite a good little show, and it's quite interesting. And another one I watched is um, on Netflix is another documentary series about people who love to cook. So, and it's it, um, the first one I've watched, which is quite interesting, is about this woman who. Um, she, you know, she worked really, really hard, and she decided that when she was going to college, she wanted to do something that she really loved, and her family really liked baking. She liked baking with her mom and stuff like this. It's quite a nice story, and the thing is, is what she did is she decided she's going to move to New York, and she's going to do whatever she did. So she worked for like 10 years, and she said, if you want to be successful in your career, you have to get there first thing in the morning and be the last one to leave, and she did that yeah. for 10 years. And then um, – she worked for this really fantastic restaurant that was like the, the number one restaurant to be be seen in. And she, she was a pastry chef, but she, wouldn't, she wasn't really into doing pastry. She wanted to be a bit more adventurous. And he sent her to this other restaurant, which was quite interesting. And then they do this thing where they do on family hour. And what, they, what you do during family hour, if you work in a restaurant, you probably experience this, that, um, you know, the cooks bake everything for everyone that's working there. And everyone brings something in and you eat together. Be, oh wow! Like service. a potluck. Yeah, and she, and, you know, she, and she'd go home, and she was like looking at things and like trying things out, and she came up with this thing where um, she goes, "Well, let's try panna cotta, for instance." So what she did is because like panna cotta comes in vanilla, chocolate, or lemon. That's as far as it goes. You know, you get this sickly, gooey thing that wiggles on your plate, and she said, "You know," so she's walking through the supermarket, and she's like, she bought some cornflakes, and then she goes. 
you know what they don't make panna cotta out of is cereal milk. Nothing's better than cereal milk. That after you finish your bowl of cereal, you always drink the milk. Uh, and so what she made, she made panna cotta from cereal milk. After you know, she let the um, corn flakes seep in it, drain it, and then made panna cotta out of it. Now it's become like this huge thing and. Great idea. Yeah. She's that. actually packaged yeah. it and, they, and it offered her to like to own, open her own um, dessert place. And like she makes cakes, but she doesn't believe in icing. She goes, you want to see what's inside a cake, yeah. you know? And she's, you know, it's, just, it's become a big business. It's, um, John, you live in New York. It's a place called Milk. Oh yeah, Milk. Yeah. 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 It's about the woman who put that together. And then there's, oh, another, wow. there's another story about uh, um, this guy from Italy who was making Italian ice cream and what he does for his flavors. It's really interesting. It's not, it's you kind of want to but you're smiling because it's, it gives you like this lift of like how you can accomplish things in your own life and they're just normal people yeah. you know who've actually yeah it's interesting it's like you're you have one you know the first story or the first show you were talking about was like what's on the outside it's not necessarily what's on the inside and the other is like thinking outside of the box like we're so used to traditionally making something you know whether it's like italian food or mexican food but like putting that flair or difference on it that's really interesting mm-hmm. Yeah, but besides that, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still watching my trashy programs like Real Housewives in New York and Real Housewives <laughs> in Orange County and America's Got Talent. And I like you know. that one. Yeah, and there's some there's some decent you know stuff out there. Unfortunately, I'm just not watching it. So <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, what have you been up to? I'm like Keith. I like to watch the trash too, but it's my it's my you know. It's, my dirty little secret when I watch it. <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm just trying to help my friend get her business off the ground. We bought all that stuff and we traveled around uh, Thailand and other countries like that and uh, put that website up. Her website's Borderlands. And um, other than that, I've been binge watching Netflix's Riverdale. And before that, uh, well, now you've got John got me interested in Stephen King's Castle Rock on Hulu. So I watched the first three episodes of that. And like I said, the king is back. It's dark and dismal and scary, and I can't wait for the next episode. That it's it's really well done. I'm really enjoying it so far because it did it, scare. It did scary. That's what I like. Nice. The dark, the dark, scary nice. stuff. The, the critics yeah. seem to be liking it as well, which is quite good. It is. Yeah. 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 That if you're a Stephen King fan, it's the show to watch because there's tons of Easter eggs in every. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It, there's tons. Yes, there are. Yeah. And um, um, then my grandson Asher, he's a BMX racer, so we're doing that on the weekends. So. Nice. I, yeah, I've been for myself. I've been like watching or trying to read as much as I possibly can about um, California, the Comic Con. So there's just been so many things that oh, have been yeah, dropped and re-released in trailers, and uh, every day I'm like, oh my god, this just came out, and this just came out. I'm like a big nerd, so I'll literally be with friends, and they're like what just happened to John? I'm like, Oh, I, you know, my friend, Oh, he's, he's in the comic con mode. Like I'll literally stop what I'm doing and watch a trailer for like super or, you know, like the flash or whatever, you know, but I've been sort of absorbed with that, but I also been, have been catching up on, um, Legion season two, which is a very trippy show. So if none of you have seen, I gotta watch that. I haven't it's, started that one. Yet. It's so good, but it's really trippy. So if you don't like trippy stuff, you might not really like it because it, you're just like, like what's going on, what's happening. <laughs> you, know, you have to like focus. It's really great. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been up to. Mm, well, there's a lot of um, stuff premiering as far as computer games as well, isn't there? Some good yeah. stuff coming out. So my, my yeah. son Tyler says. Yeah, well, I'm going to be poor by my Christmas time, so. (laughs) I know. Redemption Redemption 2, the new Laura Croft, and it just goes on and on. Well, at least I know what to get Tyler for Christmas now. You have to tell me. Well, this year, I mean, before, I mean, last year was pretty pretty slim pickings, really. So it looks like every two years is like you have this huge, you know, great stuff that's like gets to the point where it's like you actually have to go bankrupt for a year, and then you need that year off to sit there and be able to finish everything and get your bank account back. And then, then when you think you built your bank account, it's like, and we knew, we launched a new console, and you're like, damn it! Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't really that fallen for the whole Xbox new console every year. It's so like, no, I'll stick with mine, and when mine goes down, then I'll. I usually skip every other year. So, I mean, I skip every other ideation. So it's like, oh, Xbox One X. I'm going to wait for Xbox One X One. <laughs> like, I'm assuming that's, that's how they're going. It's obsolete as soon as you pull it off the shelf. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, I. You know, I guess if you have a 4K television, I would sit there and say, yeah, go for the Xbox 
one X or whatever like that. But you know, if you don't have a 4K, I don't, I don't have a 4K television. So I'm not like, if I get a 4K television, then I might look at that. But there's no sense. Yeah. We got one of those really smart TVs that are smarter than me that I'm still trying to figure out. It's like, how the fuck do you work this thing? My daughter, she was sitting there, she goes, how do you do this? I go, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so Keith is going to give us a brief reason why we are covering The Exorcist and, may, and a little bit of a brief history on it as well. Well, the reason I'm recovering next is because it is probably one of the first horror films to actually be nominated and win Academy Awards. It's also one of those films that is now, you know, part of the horror, you know, canon, the must-see films. And I've, I'm very familiar with the film to the point where I actually start laughing in most inopportune moments. But like Reagan um, dolls, <laughs> <laughs> I do have. I do, I do have a Reagan doll. I got Reagan going up, up, upside down, down the staircase. But, um, but you know, the other thing is it gave me a chance to actually read the book. It's one of those books that I never actually got around to reading. And I thought that, you know, now that we're doing the podcast and this book to screen is our main focus, that I thought, well, what better reason to have a reason to actually sit down and actually read the book that I've had on my Kindle for the last seven years. And so we started reading it. I mean, the interesting thing about it is it's all based on a 1949 case of demonic possession and exorcism that um, William Peter Bellati heard about while he was a student in 1950s in Georgetown University. And if anyone's interested, you can get information on the original exorcism, though there are a lot of websites who basically will try to debunk this, but it's basically the exorcism of Roland Doe, if anyone's interested in looking at this. And it's about a 14-year-old boy who basically had demonic possessions, and the events were recorded by attending priest Raymond Bishop. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is, is that um, newspaper articles would come out at that time giving anonymous reports of the alleged possession and exorcism and everyone involved wanted to become they really didn't want their names out there and they wanted their anonymity to be out there so leads me to believe that there might be some understanding and there might in, in the eyes of the people involved and the people surrounded this case I think that they believed it was true but the interesting thing is, is that, you know, he was playing with a Ouija board. He expect, you know, he expressed an interest in this. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, he was either possessed or he's just ginger. We're not quite sure which is the true case there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he's, um, you know, so it's quite an interesting case. And once you read about this case, and there is, there's also a TV movie would start the unfortunate bond that no one can remember is Jim, Timothy Dalton, um, who's quite virile kind of a man. And in his heyday, he did, they did a TV movie for Showtime called Possessed. So if you're interested in The Exorcist, it's quite interesting to watch The Possessed, though it doesn't have all the flourishes that The Exorcist will have. But, you know, and it's based on fact. And, you know, he based it on fact, like most good things are, like we're covering Psycho in season two, which is kind of based on the Ed Gein murders and, you know, we covered Silence of the Lands, which is based on Ed Gein as well, and other serial killers. And so, yeah, I think that's why The Exorcist is quite interesting because, you know, it's one of those based on a true story sort of thing. And I think that's, you know, the reason why we're covering it because it gives us a chance to actually talk about it. Nice. So, Vicki, do you want to give us a brief synopsis of the book? Yeah. Like I say, brief. I do have a brief one. <laughs> I even know where it is in my file. Here. Or, or a long version. It's fine. <laughs> I can give you the long version, version if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the 1971 novel by William Peter Blatty, and it details the demonic possession of 12-year-old Greg McNeil, who is the daughter of a famous actor in the novel, and a Jesuit psychiatric priest who attempts to exorcise the demon. The novel was inspired by the 1949 case of demonic possession and exorcism that Blatty heard about while he was a student in the class of 1950 at Georgetown University. The Exorcist was one of the most controversial novels ever written and went on to become a literary phenomenon. And the central and overt themes in the exorcist seem to be metaphysical. What is the nature of man? How does one explain the existence of evil? And can that be reconciled with the existence of a benign God? Deep, wow. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I've seen the movie probably six, seven times, probably more than that. But I've never read the book. And I'm actually glad that um, Keith had selected this because... Um, the book is run sort of very parallel and similar to the movie. Um, 
but there is such a uh, a longer drag in the sense of where there are build up between relationships in order to get you to um the real big climax at the end of obviously like what's happening with Reagan. Cause even the book sort of creates or paints an ambiguity as to what's happening for Reagan. And it really um, had, had the book not been named the exorcist, I think the reader would have said, you know, is this something psychological going on with the girl? Is this something that the mother, you know, is, is, you know, dealing with trying to think about, is it from a psychological medical standpoint? Cause Ultimately, um, Chris is really just trying to do what any good parent would do, which is try to figure out what's the rudimentary problem to um, what's happening with Reagan. So a lot of the book is very chronicalized by the days, uh, reoccurrences of the events that lead up to, you know, the father, the the priest coming in to ac- exercise uh, Reagan. So I love that because I think I just saw from the movie standpoint um, – you know, a completely different view. Um, what about you guys? What do you, what do you think? I thought that it ran pretty parallel. Um, <clears throat> I thought that there was a lot of the character, the, well, not, not to get to the movie first, there was a lot more to the characters in the novel than you see uh, in the movie. And uh, there, there's a lot of back, back history for each character. I thought I, it was, it kept my attention. I hadn't read it in several years. Like I said, I was reading it on the plane. It's like a little light reading. I had my laptop out and everybody's going, Oh my God, why are you reading stuff like this on a plane? <laughs> I guess I did a light reading, <laughs> but um, I enjoyed rereading it. Um, Cause it, I missed things in the novel that I didn't really pay attention to. Like when I was a student in college and I read it then. Yeah. I found, I mean, I, I enjoyed the book. I found that, it's kind of written in an odd way. It's kind of, there's not a lot of emotion in the book as far as, I don't know if that's because the Chris McNeil characters, she's quite a cold fish, really. There's not yeah. a, a real she, shitty mother. Well, yeah, she is a crappy <laughs> I think mother, she was a actually. shitty mother in the novel. I do. Well, I mean, she had an entire staff to kind of cater to her and her daughter's needs, you know. Well, let's just sit there and say she never got her hands dirty. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> literally. Literally. I mean, if there's someone's demon possessed, the last thing I want to do is change their goddamn diaper. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, what I did like about the <laughs> what I did like about the novel. How much was she paying people? Oh, I don't know. What I did like about the novel is that I like the housekeepers. I think they had a really interesting story and I yeah. really liked, you know, the you know, there's a subplot in the book, um, spoiler alert here, where you know, the wife thinks that the daughter is dead, but it's from a drug overdose, but she didn't die. And the father doesn't want to disappoint his wife, the, um, you know, the groundskeeper. And so he goes and visits his daughter and it becomes kind of a interesting subplot where because of the death of, um, Burke Dennings that, you know, that he might, maybe it was, you know, the groundskeeper that killed him. And then that comes out. I thought that was quite interesting in the book. I mean, and you know, it gave, and I found that the people surrounding Chris McNeil and even Reagan's a bit two dimensional, really. I'm considering that, you know, the, the story is about Chris McNeil getting her daughter an exorcist and what her daughter's going through. I found that the people around them had a lot more heart than the, the actual, those two main characters. I yeah. mean, and there, I mean, it, there is this weird thing about Father Marin in the beginning of the book, and we'll discuss this in the film as well. The prologue. Is, well, there's this prologue that's about five, ten pages long, and I still don't understand why it's there. Uh, it's of, because it, there was set, it was setting up to where he faced this demon, what would we call it? Pazuzu. Pazuzu's yeah. playing for everything this week, and everybody's like, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole point of the of the prologue was to was it was featured as novel and it just connects the story because uh, the, the 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 viewer and the reader have an idea that this priest has dealt with this demon before and I think that's why they're trying to set it up and I think they're trying to make it look interesting. I mean the prologue in the in the book and the movie I found really interesting. Well one I'm an archaeologist and I love that stuff. And I just I actually saw the merit in having that prologue in both because it did set up. It's like, hey, you know, I've dealt with this before. And that's why in the book, they want him to do the exorcism because he's done before, even though he killed him prior to that. 
I mean, I think it's interesting because I, I would say that it's, I agree with Keith. It's a little, it's oddly placed because it could I, be. I think when you start off that way and then you hop, then all of a sudden to this other location, um, either Pazuzu got on an international flight with him and made it back <laughs> or how did, how did it get from there to there and, and connecting the dots took the majority of not the majority. It took a segment of the book right. where you're kind of like figuring out, well, is that the same thing? Cause you almost, it becomes an afterthought, right? You have the opening where you have father Marin, you know, saying he's going to go back and almost uh, premonitionally seeing that maybe I'm not going to come back. And I think this is going to be my end. Um, and then you hop to this other story and it's sort of oddly placed. Maybe when you finally do meet Marin later again, which is well into the book, I would say, what, like four or 500 pages, he comes back into the story. He's in the last quarter. I mean, he, yeah. he pops up in the in the prologue. And it's almost, I mean, I'm kind of wondering if this is because I think if William Peter Blatty, you know, the, the book is written well. It, it carries you through from point A to point B to the end, and it keeps you very interested. But yeah. sometimes I wonder if he was a more experienced writer. And I'm not, I haven't read Legion or any of his other books. I haven't either. I'm, but I'm kind of wondering that if a more experienced writer might have either taken Father Marin's character and then bounced the story. So basically why this, everything's going on in Georgetown, maybe bounce back to him and then you keep him interested throughout the story. And that yeah. what, what you get with a lot of stories is like, you know, I just read this book called The Hidden that's um, just put a review on. And, it, you know, you get this, one story that's going on this other story and they're it's going about back and forth until the two stories combine as one where they the two characters actually meet each other and i'm kind of wondering if maybe if he was more experienced would he have done that later on you know if he yeah. if he wrote this later in his career except for this is like his first book yeah and as i said before there is this build up to father Marin, and when father Marin does show up you know he's kind of like oh okay well yeah. that's special and it's like and he's, he he's extremely well. he's extremely frail and fragile and you know yeah. it, usually in most stories when they when it opens up you usually are you encounter the hero of the story right so that's mm -hmm. you and in this case you kind of you get the hero and the villain right you now know who the hero and villain are mm -hmm. um well, but Father Karras is more like the hero. Yeah, I agree, and and I think that's what's the, the interesting thing is had they opened up with him, then it would have True. been a I, I agree very with that. strongly written point story. But maybe did did William want to break away from that sort of arc and try to do something different? You know. Well, I think I mean I think Father Karras. I mean, basically, Marin is only like a plot point for Karras to, you know, accept exorcism and give um, validity to the child being possessed yeah i mean and that's that's what he's there for it's like plot prop you know it's just you know yeah. a way to take the plot forward and get yeah. karis before his ultimate demise yeah you know, a, a, a way to look at a situation slightly differently and and that's what and so to get this build up this marin who's supposed to be the main character really yeah. from the title of the book and he's basically just a plot device to basically put karis back on track yeah, he's a sacrificial lamb, you know, and sometimes you have to die in order for the hero to truly rise. So I think that was, he was used very poignantly that way. Um, Even though they both die. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody dies. I think that it's like interesting because um, a, a lot of it is, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of buildup with um, the relationships, you know, like Chris and her assistant, um, Sharon, and then Chris and Damien's relationship and, and, and Damien and the detectives, you know, relationship. So it's Damien a lot of and his mother. Yeah. His, his bro, his bromance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. that, was the, that was the priest's name that just followed around. Father blood. Dyer. Father, not Father Dyer. Dyer. No, not Father Dyer. Wasn't there was another Jesuit. It was a novice or whatever they call them when they're. Oh, uh, the one uh, I thought, I thought Father Dyer was the one who's like. Father, well, no, Father Dyer was the other one that was, you know, He's like a, he's a, he, yeah, he's the one that was doing, sh you know, well, he's in the film, you got him playing show tunes or, well, show tunes. <laughs> he says it's fabulous. And they just Come on, up. everybody, gather around like, the piano, I'm going to play a ditty. I mean, he was like, what the fuck? Like, you got the scene where, like, he's like in Father Karras, and Father Karras' room's cold or something like this, and he's drunk, and he offers them to get him drunk, and then... 
I don't know what's going on in the film, but there seems like to be this weird subplot where, you know, he goes to get Father Karras drunk, and then he, he seems a bit disappointed that Karras is, like, passed out, so he, like, takes his shoes off. Like, whatever. It's almost, <laughs> like, like, oh. it's almost like he wanted something more. It's like, I'm going to get you drunk so he can't remember. Oh, that's, that, that's the one thing. <laughs> I'm sure this book and this movie pissed off the Catholic Church royally. I think they did, if I remember correctly. I but I also them. think especially because it deals with, um, you know, it, it – you know, um, Damien is really trying to figure this out from a scientific standpoint. So even though he is a priest, he still has to logically use, you know, his PhD, if you will, to figure out what's going on. And so I think especially if you are, there's, you know, if you leave the demonic possession aside, this also pushes the science theory of what's he has happening. faith issues too, though. Yeah, and yeah, he has strong faith issues, which we he kind of lightly goes into. Versus, I think uh, you know, it's his focus is what's really going on from a scientific standpoint. And he and I like that he in the book it's internalized, and you actually hear his thoughts and how he's trying to work it out, which you don't normally get from you know a movie where you don't hear what's going on in the brain. I mean, didn't you find yourself hard to detach the movie from the book? Um, um, yeah, to, uh, for me, yeah. Anyway. I mean, um, I kind of just look. I mean, when I, re- I was reading the book, I kind of like just threw the movie out of my mind and kind of just got just carried into the book and try not to think of the casting as the character. Right. Yeah, me uh, too. And um, I, I mean, what I think about Karis is that it is an interesting character because you have a psychiatrist who's a priest. So basically, right there, you got science against um, religion. Yeah. And which is which is quite a good thing. And then you know, you know, my grandmother used to say that when God um, closes a door, he slams all the windows shut and sets the place on fire. Uh, <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> oh, your grandmother yeah. was she a nun? <laughs> my grandmother um, would never have said that. <laughs> she might be <wouldn't> either. <laughs> uh, well, don't work. Don't no, get God to get you out of a situation. It's up to you to work yourself out of a situation. I guess is what I guess the moral of her story. Um, <laughs> but um, but the thing is, is like you know, there's always you know whether you're into the Bible or you know other things. There's always this thing of where God's always testing you. Yeah, and so you know, so that's all the, the Bible thing. is. So if you look at you know, if you do, we want to take Father Karras and sit there and let's say that he's a man of the cloth and God is testing him. So God tests his faith, like through the death of his mother, and then you know, and then it kind of carries on from that. So you do have this testament and this trial of tribulations that um, Father Karras has to go through, which I thought was very very interesting in the book, as you said, yeah. and. Uh, I still have problems with Detective William Kinderman um, in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And what we'll discuss later in the film. And I think I know why he's there. I think that I'm sure if this book was written like in the 80s or the 90s, you would probably get a more of a Thomas Harris, Clary Starling kind of effect to it. Yeah. Um, or where basically, you know, you would get more into the. You know, or even if um, James Patterson wrote it, you probably would get more of the interworkings of a criminal investigation going on. And unfortunately, it doesn't really pan out well. There's some interesting things in the book where basically it doesn't give you the information, but you're led to believe that the desecration of the church is done by Reagan. Yeah. Which is quite interesting because there's the clay that she made the bird out of. It's not a paper mache bird. It's a clay bird in this in this in the book version, and the same clay that's used on the bird is actually used in the, the same churches. Yeah. So you are led to believe, but it's a lot of like unfinished thought processes with this character. It's almost like the right on Pilates thought. Well, you know, if someone dies out front of your house, of course there's going to be a police investigation. So I might as well half-heartedly add this quirky lieutenant who's kind of a mix between Columbo and Bozo the Clown. He was trying to date all the priests <laughs> yeah. and take him to the movies. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Which was just, I mean, there was just odd moments. You're like, what is this guy doing? And what's his, why is he doing what's this? His, uh, what's his end game? Yeah. yeah. And, well, this is, what, this is what's weird because you got this book that's pretty much in the middle of reality of what life was like in 1974. True. I'm going to say 1971 because the book came out in 73. I think it's 73. But um, yeah. but so the, therefore it's like, you know, let's say the book took two years. 71. So 
the 71. So basically yep. it's going to be from between 69 to 70. Let's sit there and say that what life is like. And it pretty much reflects that. I mean, it's before, you know, it's pre energy crisis and all that other stuff that happens in after, in the after years uh, from in the seventies. But, you know, so you get all this stuff going on and, you know, and, but in this reality going on, but what's going on in Georgetown at this time. But then you got this Kinderman who's mentioning like, Fucked up movies that no one's ever heard of, you know, John. <laughs> and, you know, and, you like the and, and you know, and you're kind of thinking, I'm not quite sure why they did that. Why didn't he just mention like real actors who've done real films? Because well, it kind of, because it kind of, why was it, it always it, it was always the priest he was asking to go to the movies. <laughs> yeah. He really wanted them to. Go. No. I mean, I thought, like, you know, it could have been part of quirkiness and part of him being, like, that Columbo-type character where, you know, if you, if anyone, you know, is listening to this knows Columbo is meant to be kind yeah. of quirky because it meant that if I'm quirky, I'm going to throw you off. So I'm going to act a little zany and cuckoo, and then I'll slip in, like, and then did you do this? And did you do that? And it kind of throws the... You know, it throws. It would have been interesting if, because the book in itself is from an omni, uh, omnipotent narration, right? Right. I thought about this. How interesting it would have been is if it would have switched between perspectives. It was like Chris's perspective, the detective's perspective, and Reagan's, right? And Hopper, yeah, I agree with know, that completely. I would have liked seeing that myself. It would have been a very interesting story because he, though he acts kooky on the outside, on the inside, he could be really trying to unravel a mystery that's you know that has transpired. True. And I, I think, and as I said before, I'm just I'm just bothered by his movie references because it just all of a sudden. <laughs> well, I, no, I can those, see those, why. Wait, what was the one with Cher? It was like uh, God, I can't remember. And it was like something with Cher, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> no, the thing is, I, I think like if a younger generation reads this, and they probably they might not be as versed at older films as let's say that I am, and so basically it might not bother them so much. But I just think that if you're a reader at this time. Right. You remember television this time, you had two or three channels and it, and you saw old films. That's, you saw old films a lot. And then you have to remember that, you know, the people who were reading this book weren't teenagers. I mean, this was a bestseller book that basically was, was that spanned across lots of different age ranges. And that, for me, it just kind of took me out of it. Like, oh, this is fiction because of, because of these references. I'm never quite sure why these are used. And it was something that we'll discuss in the movie as well, that it could have been rectified for the movie, but it's not. So he, that's what he's like. He's like Weathering Heights. Who's in it? Who's in it? The detective eyebrows bunched together and scowled. Heath, uh, Heathcliff, Sonny Bono, and the role of Catherine uh, Earnshaw. Cher, are you are you not coming? I'm like, what? <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh my god! I was like, what? Uh, Sonny uh, Bono, Cher. I'm, I don't think so. Like 60s, early 70s. He might have been doing dropping some acid or something. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, but, here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe it's a style, maybe it's, maybe it's just supposed to be his humor to add to his quirkiness and maybe it's meant to be funny, but I, for some reason yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's just I mean, it goes over my head. It could yeah. be also meant to be a breaker because you can't have, I mean, you can have, but he may be the author, you know, uh, he didn't want it to be serious all the time. So you have to have that comedic breaker, you know, that's in there that kind of breaks it up a little bit, but it was awkward. Yeah, but it's, a, you know, it's a, that comedy breaker. It's the same kind of comedy breaker that you get in a, in a high school playground where someone tells you, you know, you know, basically what's green and red and goes, goes a hundred miles per hour, a frog in the blender. Ha ha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of humor. And you're kind of going, <laughs> uh, it's not like ha 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 belly laughs it's like it's like that collective groan it's like oh uh. well that, no it's funny it's too is you as a reader act that way but then so do the people that are that he's conveying this through the characters they're just kind of like what the hell yeah. <laughs> yeah that's probably why i couldn't get a date with any of these briefs <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean i mean that's you know, maybe, you know, but maybe you know, it might be something that I'm probably not getting and I don't get it. Yeah. But maybe. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about either. I just, I just found him completely annoying because he was just one of these characters that kept popping in and, and just having these ridiculous lines of reason and just going on and on. And it was to the point to where I was like, I'm surprised no one just said, shut up. I mean, at one point, I think Chris does like lose it on him, but it, but it's just one of those things where it's like, I, I didn't you know, I didn't understand his, the reason why he was there. I mean, 
we know that there's a death and he's investigating the death, but it doesn't really get until towards the end of the book that it's like, oh, if he figures out that it was possibly Reagan that killed, you know, the director, then she's going to go to jail and she's going to try. Oh, oh, okay. But it wasn't until towards the end of the book. And I was like, we, you couldn't get there sooner. <laughs> like you couldn't have relayed that sooner. Well, I think well it doesn't, he doesn't even seem like he's really investigating. It's like when people are found at the bottom of a huge stairway with their head turned around, yeah. you know, and then there's a dead priest in the room and then there's another dead priest. I thought oh, yeah. of that. I mean, it's just like, are you going to do anything with your investigation? This guy's like half acidly investigating, you know well, I mean? What I, thought, what I did like about Kinderman's character, though, is that when he does interview people to find out behind it, and the thing is, he comes in in one way, and then he's very clever with the way he, and I thought this was quite well done in the book for, for this character, where he goes in one angle, and then he just twists it around and catches the person and, um, and then mentions something that's realistic, you know, as far as, you know, when he questions them, to catch them off guard and see what kind of answer they got. And I thought that was quite well done in the book. Um, yeah, and Great. you know, and, and that part in that part of the situation. Now the thing is, Kinderman. I know. See, I think if we had some kind of religious backing for him, that it might make sense because at the end of it, it's like you know, after Karis dies, and then he's kind of come to peace with it. You know, it's like okay, and it's like, well, is it because of he's religious and he believes in exorcism? Does he know about the exorcism? He knows that yeah. the daughter's sick, but does, he never really says that he knows exactly why she's sick for. Her. So at the ending, and there's this weird epilogue where him and Father Dyer go walking down, go walking off into the sunset together, like a really bad Simpsons cartoon. But um, <laughs> but you know, the thing is, like he's kind of accepted that this is what's happened, but you don't what has happened in his mind? How does he looked at this from his mind? And the book just kind of lets that float out. Well, we, and we talk about it too. It's like, you know, there is this sort of, there's all these different relationships that are going on. You see these different interactions between the different characters and how they each interact with each other. And it, the ending to that, the book was uh, this lackluster. I mean, it's a perfect word. Cause again, he's been investigating for so long, this situation. And then the mom, you know, Chris and Reagan just kind of hop in the car and we're going to, we're going to go. Thanks. See you later. Like, and then yeah, we kill three or four and people. Then, it's just like toodles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't mind the bodies that are up there, you know, one <laughs> going out the window, the other one's still up there, you know, so it's really weird, but I think it's like, he kind of just, pushes it under the rug without any explanation. Like you said, is it is it a religious thing or is it a, I'm diving into some dark waters and I, I'm afraid to kind of go any further. So let's just leave it where it is. Right. Let's just let it go. You know? And I think you know, it's never really explained. Yeah. Well, I also think that, um, and this is what Vicky was saying earlier, maybe the movie bleeding into the book a little bit where yeah. I'm assuming that, Kinderman, because in the movie he comes across as Jewish, so I'm assuming that Kinderman is Jewish as well. So, yeah, like, and if if that's the case, I don't know. I could be missing, you know, I could be trying to, you know, strike a home run here and like totally missing it and just hitting foul balls here. <laughs> but you know, I don't because you're not quite sure what his religious backing is. If it, let's say they're say that he is Jewish, it would be quite interesting to have some background story or some kind of information or even like a couple of sentences there about what's the Jewish faith concerning exorcisms and do they exist or just a little bit, just something there. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, the, but since saying this, I think that Kinderman and is better drawn out than Chris McNeil's character. Chris McNeil is just a cold fish. Yeah, well, I mean, I she agree. doesn't. She didn't seem like. I mean, I, I've got three children and a grandson, and I just thought her. her I'm sorry, I'm a bitch this way. Her, her, she had lackluster mothering skills, and she told. If that was my child, and that was going on upstairs in the room, I mean, I would be moving heaven and earth, yeah. and you know, I wouldn't be pushing everybody's diapers. <laughs> the I demonic know. child, and I know. I mean, I mean, these people. How much are they paying her back in seventy one? Was it been away to like two bucks an hour, two thirty five or something ridiculous? Like what the fuck? I just you know, think, I think above that- and beyond. Yeah. I mean, I also just think that Reagan's more fleshed out than Chris is because even when you meet Reagan, she's this sort of picture of virtue and is, 
kind and artistic and creative and and open like her mind is open and she's she's literally you know granted a little bit too open because you know she's messing around with the ouija board and stuff but like literally she's inquisitive and and you get more from her character and the torture of what she's going through than you do from chris and, and it, you could lead in to say that maybe it's because she's chris is some har- uh, you know hollywood starlet who has been so, you know, trying to stay in her career and being, you know, popular and being, a, you know, a potentially a director, right? And and living in that world that she forgets that she has to be a mother where everyone else is the mother, right? The the housekeeper, the assistant, the, the groundskeeper, all of them take care of this girl. So yeah. it makes sense why, why maybe she is so flat that way. And it did, I, mean, I don't know if this is reading the book from a 2018 perspective. Could but, be. But the thing is, is that Chris McNeil, I kind of want, it's almost like, I'm not sure if she's worried about what's going to happen to her daughter or she's, or she's worried about what happened to her daughter is going to affect her career. Yeah. Simple fact is like, oh, you know, don't, I mean, about the, maybe the press is going to find out or something like this. And to be honest, I don't know what kind of actress she is because the only t- the only kind of relationship that you have as far first of all Reagan has no friends that we know yeah. of. I know that he's yeah. the George Aside from but- Mr. Howdy, right? Mr. Howdy, yeah. who? Howdy, Miss Howdy. Captain Howdy, Mr. Captain Howdy. Captain. Captain Howdy, her imaginary friend. Well, you know that I mean, you know that, and I, you know, it's almost like Chris won her out of a divorce settlement. So it's like, yeah. so we don't know if there's a there's a there seems to be some kind of power struggle between Chris and Dad's and gone. Ex husband. Yeah because um, the ex-husband's run off with a younger version of Chris probably now as far as her her being an actress well the only thing we really know is she's doing a movie in Georgetown um, we don't get the scene that we get later on in the movie which we'll discuss but um, right. but the only other thing that we know is that she's known but apparently she's made some bad films because Kinderman brings up one of her bad films and goes oh you saw that you know so we don't know what kind of actress or what caliber of actress she is we know she's an actress but for all we know, she could be a soap opera actress or she could be a Hollywood, a big Hollywood draw or she could just be one of those people who just appears in films like Mary Wicks. Yeah. 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 We, we, do, we do get, though, as a mother, you know, there's a slight glimpse into her head where she mentions the child that she had that died, you know. Yeah. Jane. And we do, I mean, it, to me, it's like I do hear or, or you know, not hear, see the regret that's there. That's sort of an underline of I don't know what happened, but it's not translated, especially towards the end, which, you know, we'll get into. Obviously, right. you mentioned at the beginning, spoilers, lots of spoilers um, that, you know, you would think there is this huge transformation of the character. Right. And what happens with her in this situation? And she's an atheist. Right. So she doesn't believe in anything. She believes, you know, that that this first is science and then has to believe maybe it's not science, you know? And there's really, if you think about it, the only people who are, who are religious, like is, is her assistant, Sharon, um, the housekeeper. And, you know, I don't really even know if the groundskeeper would say he's super religious, but it's all of her supportive fan, The yeah. people that are taking care of her, the religious ones who are trying to, you know, bring that into the conversation and she just doesn't want to hear it, you know, like, you know. Did they ever explain in the book who put the crucifix under the pillow? That could have been Reagan, you know, that that's was another... That, was, that, was, that, was, that was, was in the book as well, wasn't it? No, it was in the book, book because she went off on the assistant, remember? She right, like went yeah. in, related right. to Sharon and was like, you did this, I know you put this on here, you know. And Sharon's one of those hippie yeah. figures who I don't think she really does deal with god as we know it or god as the christians know it isn't she into more like alternative religions you know yeah, mm-hmm. you know, buddhism and you know burning and, sage and all that kind of stuff and, uh, and but it's interesting because that's one thing that this, the book does a really good job is it leaves a lot of like well, what the hell how did that happen like you know yeah. the cross and then you know like you said the um it was in the book it's a number of times that the um the in the church what happens in the the sacrilegious you know graffiti we all know that the crucifix shows up later <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so it's like one of those things where you don't know necessarily is it reagan coming out to try to protect herself and knows that i'm going to use a cross because she, she does uh share and does confess to chris that she does talk to her about religion so does she 
yeah. thought of the spell and it was like, oh, I need a cross to protect myself from whatever the hell's inside. I definitely me. needed more than sage, let me tell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sage was not cutting it. I mean, but the thing is, is I mean, the thing is, her daughter's ill, very ill, and it's to the point where you know she's kind of bedridden, really. And then she throws a party, so that's oh, not yeah. exactly mother yeah. of the year. And then, <laughs> but I always I've, another thing I found quite strange about Blatty's book as well. There's a lot of unfinished strings Business. that are left hanging. The single fact that you know there's this astronaut that's at this party, and right. Reagan goes, "You're going to die up there," to the astronaut, not to Bird Dennings, but to the astronaut. Now, did she foresee something or not? Because we don't know because has, this person just disappeared. Never ha- yeah. Never mentioned yeah. again. And then you had this um, person who, um, you know, is a psychic. And that was quite interesting. But then again, you know, she's at the party. She drops off a book for Chris. Chris reads the book. She doesn't want to get involved. And then that's it. She's kind of disappeared for the rest of the book. But she was quite interesting. And he just thought that. You could have made something out of this character, made it some. Quite, yeah, quite I wish they actually utilized her more. She was a very interesting character. Not the whole astronaut thing too is, and I think we yeah. we talked about this before. It was confusing because I even when watching the movie, I didn't know who was killed, like who. So when they mentioned that, I thought in the book, I was like, oh, that's the person that gets thrown out the window. I was like, wait, no, <laughs> like that's not the one that gets thrown out the window. <laughs> Well, I mean, but even the Burke Dennings character, I mean, it's a, it's a quite an odd character. Okay, I know he's a director, and he seems to be, to be honest, he seems to be the only friend that Chris has. Because mm-hmm. Chris, you know that Apollo thirteen. Because Sorry, before I forget that Apollo thirteen went up in April thirtieth, nineteen seventy. So maybe that's what she was talking. Oh, uh, possible, but. I mean, so, but you got the Burke Dennings character, and um, he's a and real jerk. He's a horrible character, but this seems yeah. to be her only friend, <laughs> really. Because That's pretty sad. That's her character, really right? Yeah. Well, because the other people at this party, you don't know why they're there or who they are. You don't know how she knows them because there's no, you know, di- you know, there's no. As far as her interaction is, she just kind of floats in and out and plays hostess, but she doesn't really have any conversations with anybody. You know, no, not really. And I, you know, Chris McNeil is one of those kind of characters that, you know, it's kind of weird because Chris McNeil is one of these iconic characters, but but she's not a character that has a lot of depth to her, really. Which yeah, she's really iconic in the movie, really. Well, and, and you don't really get an explanation as to why she is atheist. You know, usually a you know diversion of faith is usually something leads to that you know unless you're raised in a house that but i have been interested yeah. to see where there's an abandonment of faith or you know not having that so and, well i mean her atheism could be from the loss of her first child true yeah that's true you know? and yeah that, that tends that that does tend to happen and so it makes reagan kind of like the changeling which is like yeah. placing a child she could have been better by the loss of her child but, but even like, even when Reagan's in full capacity here, where she's not, you know, being, you know, taken over by unseen forces, for say, you know, even when they go around Georgetown, and you get kind of nice little information here where they're going around Georgetown. Yeah. But it doesn't, it's not a warm, you know, she's spending Buzzy. time with her. Well, she's yeah. spending time with her. Well, okay, big whoop D. Yeah. You know. But why did he place her like that, though? Was it something that Vladdy had experienced in his life, perhaps? I mean, because he did make her a cult. She looks like she's a caring mother. She's taking her to doctors. She's trying to find her a witch doctor, she says. She's doing all these things. And, but it's well, maybe, maybe, Bla- maybe Vladdy has problems with um, writing for women characters. I mean, he's a male, yeah. he's a male yeah. author. And sometimes, you know, it's a bit like sometimes in female writers, you'll you will get a lack of depth in some of the male characters. They tend to be too dimensional, but female ca- characters that they write for can be really full of the depth. In this case, we got the opposite, where the male characters have a lot of depth to them. Yeah, you, you, know, even, you probably you, got divorced. But even, <laughs> yeah. but even but even Kinderman, when it comes to the simple fact that you know is a character that's an odd character, but there's a lot more depth to Kinderman, and even to Father Mirren to a certain extent. 
than right. than Chris. The only thing that you get sure. from Chris is that she seems to be horny for anyone that's a man of the cloth. She seems to <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that. There's always like, hey. sexual tension going on. But even when Father Mirren shows up, there seems to be a, a bit of sexual tension there as well, which is kind of odd. Um, Have you ever, go, well, I, I don't know if you'd appreciate it, but we always had, we, when I was in Sacred Heart, I hope everybody listened to Mark Townsend. I was like sticking it to him every once in a while. <laughs> but we, they would force us to go to confession, especially in second grade. What the hell got to confess in second grade? <laughs> when we got older, there's like, I won't name him because I know he left the church. But there was a priest there, as a young man with blue eyes and blonde curly hair. Let me tell you, all of us were lined up in the confessional. We were named Brian <laughs> to go into his confessional. <laughs> You're talking about Father Harry. Father Whataways. That's what we Father Whataways. Yeah, Father Harry. Father Whataways. <laughs> <laughs> I got a story about Father, I got a story about Father Harry, which I'll share with you when we're finished. <laughs> was it a Harry situation? <laughs> Let's just sit there and say that he bent in more ways than one. So <laughs> <laughs> it warranted three Hail Marys. <laughs> no, you have to go do. Remember they send us to do our what was it after we got out of confession, Keith? We'd have to go pray in the pew. We'd have to do five Hail Marys, twelve Our Fathers, depending on our crime. <laughs> the Apostles' uh, Creed or whatever. Well, I, I was Episcopalian, so I didn't have to do any of that stuff. I think one of the best relationships in the the book is the relationship she has with Damien because it's it's there is something that I do feel like they each kind of get through to each other mm-hmm. in, in a very odd way. Again, someone who is atheist, someone who is supposed to be a man of the cloth, right, and then someone who is science who is trying to convey to the mom that she has to believe it could maybe be something beyond science that's, that's intervening. Um, it's the problem. The bigger problem that I have with Chris is that she wasn't transformative that, yeah. you know, not only was she flat and had no depth at the end of, again, if any of us witnessed this crap, that this woman in I me, mean, literally crap that this woman had uh, saw that her daughter went through, you would think it would have changed her. Instead it was like, Okay, we're packing up, going to go. I was like, a, Hollywood, you know, and I'm like, what? The employees, though. I mean, if you were seeing some of that shit, I would have been out the fucking door. The workman's comp isn't going to cover it. But it was just, it was almost like they were on a summer retreat and it just went horribly wrong. And then they're like, we're going to go back home now. And I would, I would be like, I would be so, like, you know, damage, you know. It, it, but, yeah. but even if she was frightened, I mean, she's never really frightened. She's, she seems more confused, but she's never frightened. And if you consider, like, you know, you got your daughter who masturbates at a crucifixion and sticks your face into her lap. I don't know if that and, masturbation. That's you know, and the thing is, and Chris is never really truly horrified. You know what I mean? Yeah. In, in the text, there's not, she's, not, she's never really truly horrified what's going on. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like she's kind of washed her hands. And so I'll stay downstairs and you guys take care of her. You know what I mean? I think she's, I think she's exhausted because there is a point to where she's exhausted. But, like, you're right. There's no... Like, I just can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't see her like this anymore. It's more like, I'm tired. I'll be up later. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just tired, you know. I'll, I'll well, how do you sleep in the house? For yeah. one, yeah. I mean, yeah. I would be able to sleep. I had one eye open the whole time, man, and one foot on the floor ready to rock it. But even, if, even still, if someone went through this, someone you care about, you love went through this, you would never look at them the same. You would, there's no effing way you could ever look at that person the same way again and be like and it was just like at the end she's like oh come on honey we're gonna go you know and she puts her hand around her and i'm like what i would be like um it's not realistic i'd be like put her in the trunk keep chains on her i know just put her in there it's okay you know <laughs> like it's no well, it's just not kinda, realistic i mean i'm kind of wondering if it's um maybe it's written this way because maybe it's a layover from the night late 1950s 1960s housewife sort of thing uh, where you know like when you watch like old tv shows whether it's leave it to beaver or daddy knows best or whatever and you and you always got the wife she's never over distraught is she she's like yeah. gonna hold it together and there's always a bit there's always a lack of feeling in anything even yeah. if you watch the dick van dyke show with mary tyler moore as the mother right there's always a, on a happy face you put on the you know she is an actress she has to put on the oh the role of the doting mother you know she wasn't name- doting I mean, at the end, she was. That's what I'm saying. Right. She was just like, oh, you know. And, you know, I'm surprised she didn't say, you know that pony we talked about, the gray one? We're going to get for you. You know, like she just had that doting little, you know, rapport with her. So, But, I mean, if you look at the media, really, when you have these mother mothering roles in, in like, television side of the things, the films went a bit 
Films, well, film pretty much in this time period were pretty much the same as well. You never really got the over emotional woman, the mother, the over emotional mother sort of thing. And maybe yeah. this is Blatty's kickoff from that. Maybe this is, you know, what he was basing it on. Maybe it wasn't yeah. because, you know, there is. How old was he when he wrote this? The 71. Mm-hmm. Probably I, think was I, late I imagine between 69 and 71. Oh. I imagine before it was released, it normally take it probably had a two year. I mean, he, he did. Go, I mean, he was at Georgetown in the nineteen fifties. Fifty, that's right. Okay, when, yeah. When he was, um, and that's when he read about the thingy uh, about the original possession. So he went to Georgetown, then around this time period. So I imagine that. So he's in his twenties, probably. Yeah. Then. So I imagine that. You know, maybe maybe this is the reason why Chris is the way she is. I was just trying to figure out where his head maybe was. Maybe the man that basically was in segregated um, education his whole life and never really had right. a lot of... Well, That's it's true. weird, though, because she does have breaker moments. Like, there's a moment where she literally... She just loses it and on Damien, and it's like, you know, like, fuck, you know, what? The, the priest sent me to the doctors, and the doctor sent me to the priest. She loses it. So are these, there are these moments that she breaks from you know, that picturesque Hollywood esque starlet. So it's right. weird that, but, that but, happens, but then at the end you don't it doesn't carry through. That's that's my no. problem. It's like there but, is a weird build there. But even at that point where she does do this, I mean it is from a selfish point of view, it's kinda of like the same time, you know, you basically go to renew your driver's license and they send you to this woman, but then you have to go to this other one because they yes. you need this yeah. form and you fill out that form and you take it to this window and they don't accept it to that form because they need this form at this window. And, and that kind of breakdown that she does have is that kind of person who's been shoved from window to window while trying to renew her driver's license. Yeah. You know, which yeah. Is, you know, from a, you know, she just, she's just frustrated, but she's not frustrated for because of the care of her daughter. So I think she's frustrated because she's like I don't know if she's frustrated because, oh, my God, I got to take Reagan somewhere else. Or she's frustrated like, God, I really can't stand to spend, spend more time. Or it yeah, feels like you're like, behind can, somebody. Can this be over? Like, can we yeah. just have this over? You know? really, it's, it, she kind of reminds me of, this is why I am anyway, like when I go to the store and want to pay for gas or it's whatever, and there's somebody in front of me that's buying 20 fucking water tickets. Oh. It's like, God damn it. It's like, oh, you know. Oh. Yeah. But I mean, the power falls out. <laughs> but then again, what we have at Chris's character is like we have another, you know, thread here that's not picked up. She's in the middle of a moving, um, filming a picture that we know of with Burt Dennings, who's the director of this picture. He dies. She doesn't mention anything about what happened to the film that she's filming. And did it stop filming? Did she stop going to work? Or yeah. you know, so there's a lot of unfinished business that does go on in this book. But say, I mean, I'm assuming I'm assuming it stopped the moment he died. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. The, the time periods are a bit odd here as well. You don't really have a fresh idea of time periods. You know that Damien's mother, she got, you know, she got tied in, but then she did went back home and she was there a couple months. It, it took a, like what she died. It took a couple months to find her body. Mm. So, and then you don't know how long she was in the hospital for. So you're not quite sure how long they are in Georgetown for, and where they are in the process of the movie. It seems like a three to six month period of dying transition. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Because how long does it take to make a movie? You know. Well, it depends. I mean, you know, if you're. But we also know when we don't know when we're coming into that. If that's like the first scene or the last scene. Do you remember if it's cold or warm? Do you remember in the the book? Well, I think it was always cold, but yeah. You know, they don't, they don't really get a set of, um, set of time. Actually, I think that it's springtime because don't they go and see the cherry blossoms in Georgetown, in Washington? I believe so. Um, yeah. So that means springtime. So it happens in springtime. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long it is. But I mean, if you try to gauge it from like Karis's point of view, Karis visits her mom, his mom, and then time passes. And then, he, then the, her, his brother in the book Puts, them in, puts her mom into a mental institution because they don't have the money to give her proper care. And then she dies, while, but it takes a couple months to find the body. So I don't know how long she's in the hospital for and until t- they send her home and what happened. And then, you know, and then in between, we don't know what time period we are dealing with. Talk about the Catholic the guilt, man. He's got Catholic guilt, Father Chris does. He got that down to a sign. Mm-hmm. But why did oh you do God. this to me? Why did you do this to me? Why you do this to me, Jamie? I say that to people all the time. Why you do this to me? To I love me? scaring the hell out of people. What are you talking about? They don't know what I'm saying. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> it's like, Paris, what? you're not even here with us. 
Yeah. You know, one of the things I do like about the book too, is that you don't give much of the demon dialogue in the movie. Like in this, it's like you get the variations of the different voices coming out of Reagan. You actually get dialogue between the demon and Damien. And I thought that was really fascinating because I was like, you know, the movie only paints one side of it. This definitely gives you a deeper look at right. how the demon is being manipulative and what it's trying to do in order to get what it wants. I like that. Well, I mean, Reg, I mean, as you said before, it would have been quite nice to have some in- internalization of Reagan because right. she's yeah. basically a husk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You know, <laughs> no, no, she is just a vessel. <laughs> uh, out, out, you know, outside of her, you know, playing with the Ouija board and making a bird for her mom, she does, as I said before, she has no friends. She, you know, she, we know that she's good at math and, wins a, and apparently the demon's crap at math. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, then after that, it's like Reagan disappears. And even at the end, she's kind of like, okay, well, she's kind of a wet little girl. I mean, there's not a lot of, she, she doesn't come across as the most, you know, character character driven girl of all times you know that's just kind of like and she she's just a vessel in the book that's yeah, really that's all she is, is. Yeah. and they also they're they're very <laughs> very violent and visceral with the senses in this book especially like yeah. you know the smells and the sounds and the the sights and the, t- and the ass beatings and the touches and then how you does know, she they, survive the all the fart, ass beatings? The farts that smell like sauerkraut. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> God, oh, you know. <laughs> you would bring that up. You're, oh, you're I have to because I remember brain. reading it going, good Lord, like this guy. <laughs> I, oh. I hate it when you and Keith share a brain. It scares me. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I think that, I mean, as far as, I think I would have liked in the book version anyway. I mean, I can understand you know, when we get to the film later, but I think it would have been quite nice to have the demon possession. Some scenes be a bit more realistic because I know that when she turns her head in a three, uh, 360 degree angle, she turns it all the way around in the book. I mean, when you read it, sometimes I think to myself, because sometimes I think when you read it, you start internalizing things a bit more and you start thinking about it a bit more than you. And if you see it, like when you see it in film footage, you kind of like kind of accept it. But in books, you're kind of thinking like, well, you know, it's yeah. quite a it's quite a nice passage in the book where you think to myself, like, how can this really happen? Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Without because her dying and breaking her neck. Yeah, exactly. Precisely, yeah. You know, because you're you know, you know, and I know that, you know, she's possessed by the demon and everything like that. But at the same time, you know, your body can only contort to a certain yeah. degree. I can as far as I can go. Well, and you know, Fish nowadays bowl. there's so many different contortionists, so it's like, you know, <laughs> They yeah, can't do that. So, when I started seeing when they can their head 360 degrees around in one angle, all the way around. <laughs> but it's, right. it's interesting you say that because, like, you look at other, you know, if you just take this movie out and look at other possession movies, like the demon often like snaps the neck or breaks the back or whatever, yeah. and it sort of so the body is like, like you said, just a husk. So if you if it's able to like crack or do that, you're kill, you're literally killing. So. There's nothing explained by that. If it's a de- it's yeah. a delusion, is a priest just seeing that in their head, or is it her physically doing it? You know, you guys clearly haven't had a Thai massage. <laughs> 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 it's a game changer. My presumption. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think I think it's I think it's I think it's more of these cases where Blatty, you know, you know, so it just keeps turning up the volume more and more and more. And I think that's what led to, you know, led to it because it, it gets more and more progressive and things like that happening. But as you said before, you know, in reality terms, like you don't really want to harm the vessel that you're occupying. Yeah. Because once that vessel's gone, True. you're going to have to find another vessel. You're going to have to find yeah. another body. So, you know. You know, it's, you know, it's fine and dandy to have like super supernatural strength and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But you know, you don't really want to twist the back to a point where it breaks because you're not, you know, the demon is not going to be able to fix that back. So yeah. So. Yep. But, there it is. There it is. So um, before we begin our discussion of the film, we're going to take a short commercial break as well as have a listen to the trailer. So we'll be right back. Let's play a game. I will ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Do you have a rocking chair to relax on? Do you have space to store your toddler's toys if an unexpected guest came over? Can you lay down comfortably on your couch? 
If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the new IKEA catalog. Visit IKEA at Cairo Festival City and get your free copy. Enjoy 1,000 new ideas and more than 2,000 new lower prices. IKEA 2018 catalog. Make room for life. IKEA. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. The world of darkness. Nobody expected it. Nobody believed it. And nothing could stop it. There are no experts. You probably know as much about possession as most priests. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. I'm telling you that that thing upstairs isn't my daughter. Now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that! The one hope, the only hope, the exorcist. Amazon is here to make your life easier. By just the tap of a button, you can turn the camera on your phone to your own personal shopping list. Introducing Flow. Just tap the camera icon under the search bar and you can find whatever it is you're looking for. Right on Amazon. Faster than scanning a barcode and typing the name of your item into the search engine. Besides, searching with words is so 2012. Save time and money. Amazon, where shopping meets effortless. And we're back. And to start our discussion of the film, uh, Keith, why don't you start it off? Basically, the film came out. Um, but before it came out, um, what's interesting about this is that William Peter Blatty, before the novel came out, actually sold the rights to Hollywood at this time and contacted a lot of different directors. And he wanted to go with William Friedkin because William Friedkin just won the Oscar for French, uh, The French Connection. And William Friedkin's an interesting director who's not known for being the most gentlest on sets. He's known to actually slap people to get the reaction he wants before he starts filming. Yep, he did. And, or um, shoot blanks. <laughs> shoot blanks, yeah. He's one of these, you know. I mean, it was quite an interesting time at this time. We're now looking at the studio system at this time is now gone. And what happened is in the 70s, was a very interesting time in films and they would try out a lot of different stuff because they really didn't know um, through Hollywood up until about the um, early 60s, they kind of knew what people wanted. And what happened was with the hippie generation coming in and the loss of that, they were kind of finding their way. And so Hollywood very, was very experimental at this time. And that's why you got Roman Polanski coming out with things like Chinatown and all these kind of very interesting films of the 70s. <laughs> Can you imagine now that if a director bitch slapped an actress to get a, a rise out of her while she was... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that would not have her. happened. Yeah. Can you imagine? Um, oh, my God. Um, we'd all be protesting today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, the, I mean, another interesting thing about the whole filming aspect of this thing is, is that the, everything here, this is... You know, for the young audience out there, this is before CGI, so everything's very natural effects. Every, they had to find ways to film certain scenes, especially when we get into the exorcism and the possession of Reagan. And they did find um, Linda Blair. Um, she actually did win the role. But it's quite interesting. There was other care, um, other actresses that they wanted for the role, but Freakin didn't want anyone that came with any excess baggage. When I mean excess baggage, is like, they became known. We had Pamela Ferdin, who was quite known for doing commercials, who later go on to do um, Saturday morning um, cartoons in the 70s. Well, they weren't cartoons, they were live actions, like R2 is one oh, of yeah. the series that she did. And then 
And so he decided to go with an unknown, which was um, Linda Blair, which I have to admit that after watching the making of it, I didn't realize that Linda Blair was so much in the exorc- the, when the possession scenes. She and that's all her. It's only it's, they used the they used a doll in her image in two scenes. The rest of it is her. Yeah. So, I had death threats because of that movie. She had a lot of problems because of that. She went well. They also like had tests make up her. So they, they, you know, he wanted to go really authentic, and they did different variations of the makeup, and and they would not sort of settle until they got to exactly what he wanted. And it wasn't subtle at all. No, not at all. And <laughs> so it, it was like no, on, it was on point and terrifying, like how how accurate he got it, and different from the, the novel because mm-hmm. not the novel the char- the demon was more like skeletal. It's like, you're raised Catholic and you're raised on the devil, you know, by a bunch of crazy nuns. So they really definitely gave it, hit it, hit it home for you. <laughs> but I think that there's some very interesting choices that could have came out of this. Like Father Marin was originally going to be Marlon Brando. Yeah. Which is quite yeah. interesting. And the director was going to be Mike Nichols, who was, oh. you know, do, who did The Graduate. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and even um, Jack Nicholson was offered the part of Car- um, Karis, Stacey Keach. Um, Paul Newman wanted to put, portray Karis, um, but, you know, Freakin spotted um, Paul Newman doing Jason it. Miller following a performance of Miller's play, The Championship Season in New York. So he's a, he was a stage actor. And then the part of Chris, I mean, you know, Jane Fonda, Audrey Hepburn, and Bancroft were mentioned, which I have to admit okay, that Bancroft. even Shirley MacLaine, which would have been quite interesting considering yes. the yeah. history of Shirley MacLaine later on that we got with right. the simple fact that, you know, with her reincarnation lives and her book series that she ended up coming out with um, would have been a, quite an interesting choice. But um, yeah. the reason why um, Shirley MacLaine turned down that she did the possession of Joel Delaney in 1971, two years prior to that. So she didn't want to do another possession film. Yeah. So get typecasted Alan, into that. So we got Alan Bernstein, which I have to sit there and say, because of the other people not willing to take part in the film, and a lot of them didn't really didn't want to do a film about the devil or possession. I think that's the reason why we did get a brilliant cast. A fortune, I think it's fortunate enough. I mean, I love Jane Fonda and I love Anne Bancroft, but I think it's fortunate enough that they didn't do it. Or no. Jack Nicholson. Can I you think imagine Jack Bancroft knocked it out of the park, though? Well, I mean, I don't. I'm not quite sure because. I think it would have been it would have been different a whole right. totally different sort of thing. I just and, love Anne Bancroft. Oh, I like I love Anne Bancroft as well. I think you know, she's so multifaceted and she's a great loss. I mean, I think when she passed, I think we oh god yeah all yeah treasure there and and I think it's she's an undiscovered um, treasure really an un- unherited treasure because she's not really mentioned too much you know not at but, all. But I think that Alan Bernstein did a fantastic role with part in this. And I mean, can you imagine like, you know, Damien Karras played by Jack Nicholson? I would have seen <laughs> him. I actually, though, though I would say that Jack Nicholson might have been better portrayed as Lieutenant William Kinderman. I'm just saying. No, kid, that would have been, yeah. yeah. been it. That would have yep. been it. Mm-hmm. But you're right, though, that the fact that they were really unknowns pretty much like Alan Bernstein. Jason Miller. <laughs> I mean, now that the other, as far as directors go, I mean, outside of Paul, Don, no, Mike Nichols, I mean, they did ma- mention Mark Rydell, who went on to do Grease and For the Boys, so that would have been interesting. But um, but Stanley Kubik might have been an interesting choice if he chose. I mean, I, I think that Free Freakin did a fantastic j- job. I don't think anyone could surpass him, but I'm just sitting there saying, I think Kubik would have done something quite interesting. It would have been a, yeah. a, another totally different film because it would have been a, a Kubik film. Which, yeah, you know, I don't think it would have also been more scenic because there's parts of, of the movie that's very meant to be kind of light and you know like, the bond yeah. as you call it, bonding moments where it's like oh we're showing you where where we're at right now. You know? Well, Jason Miller, though, didn't you think he portrayed the suffering and the guilt and the anxiety? Just he just he just it was just he it, the part was made for him. Yeah, it really was. But that was also exuded within the character versus in the book. I think he was less traumatized by what happened to his mom. In this, he was definitely traumatized, and it kept yeah. reoccurring as a theme for him. Well, when you see her sitting up in the bed, Dini, why you do this? That, that, that part yeah. scared the shit out of me when I saw that. That was like, oh, 
Uh, well, even the, even the scene when he's it's sort of a weird and this is the only thing it's like it's not linear in some ways because you don't know the timing of everything like when he goes right. to the apartment and then there's another flash and then he's seeing her in the hospital that's right. heartbreaking because anyone's ever had to like have someone in you know yeah. home. she can't even look at him she's just turned away and she's like no yeah. you did this to me you did this to me Danny. oh man if my kids oh. ever do that to me i'm gonna fuck with their conscience terrible you're gonna I possess them <laughs> <laughs> I will just ruin it for them. Guild, Italian guilt. I know how to You're do it. Send Pazuzu after them. Send Pazuzu, yeah. Pazuzu, everything up Pazuzu. I mean, what's another interesting thing about this film? It's one of the highest grossing films in history. Wow. For that day. Uh, and I mean, it did, it did win two Oscars. It won Best Sound Mixing, which I totally agree with, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Yeah. Which, that was, and it's now considered one of the best scariest films of all times as well through a lot of different... Well, you can't um, top that. They can't remake that. There's never going to be a redo or a reboot. I mean, you just can't beat that. I don't care what kind of well, special effects people have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, never say they, they'll never be. I know, I should. Never say never, yeah. Exactly. I should knock, I mean, knock out wood. I know. I should they, they actually, I'm surprised it hasn't been mentioned. but Well, it, they have actually done a series, which um, I have not watched, but I'm now interested in watching because, of, you know, a friend of mine had said to watch it because there's sort of a twist in it. Because the one on Netflix? Yeah, I think it's on Netflix, maybe. But it's... Um, yeah. It's just an interesting take. It was on Fox and for two seasons. Okay, um, I know what you're the talking first about. Se- the first season of Exorcist is fantastic, and there is a fantastic twist. And let's just put it that The Exorcist, without giving anything away for the TV series, because I know we, we're going to do a lot of spoilers for the film, but I'm not going to do any spoilers for the TV series. Right. But let's just sit there and say that the series is probably one of the best sequels to the film. Yeah. That, really? And, and, yeah, the and then not uh, able to articulate. Uh, was there only two seasons? Are going to be a third, or is it just two? Um, there's two. They there's a potential because there, you know how something dies and on one network and could potentially. So there's true, a potential true, like, yeah. or to a Hulu or Amazon. But right now it's a dead. But Gina Davis is in it. Um, uh, who? Yeah, but yes. yeah. So there, it's it's a great series. I think it's. Um, I'll check it out then. Yeah, no, I'll just binge watch the scary. <laughs> I would say watch The Exorcist the movie. Once you see that, try the TV series. And okay. the, the first se- season one, season two goes off on a tangent a little bit. But season one's worth it. Season two of The Exorcist is like hero season two. That gives you an yeah. indication. Okay. Yeah. Or it kind of goes up its own backside. Like a Matrix film. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're caught in uh, the meta of it all. <laughs> uh, precisely. So I think it's um you know one of, just some tidbits. I also, if you haven't seen the documentary uh, that's based on The Exorcist, it's actually really interesting to watch. Um, the, some of the things they talk about. One is um, the demon Pazuzu. I should say the voice of the demon Pazuzu, yeah. um, played by Mercedes McBridge, um, was what Orson Welles called the world's greatest living radio actress. So in order for her to prepare for the role, she actually um, swallowed raw eggs, chain smoked, yeah. and drank whiskey to make her voice harsh. And um, the director also had had basically strapped her down to the chair to get really the authentic, you know, nature of, of the character. Um, she first wasn't credited for the voice, but later, um, through the help of the Screen Actors Guild, they actually were able to give her proper notoriety for oh, it. She should have got it for that voice, because that's yeah. just going to be just when he's screaming Marin as soon as he comes in the house. Yeah. That just, like, I mean, I got goose pimples just seeing him thinking about like, that's scaring the shit out of me. Um, and it had like twist of the story um, in, in her real life. Um, her son um, had tried to do like a Ponzi scheme, a $5 million Ponzi scheme on her, basically taking money from different accounts and depositing into another account using her name. And when it was discovered, um, he refused to cooperate and with the investigation. And, and sadly, he killed his wife, who was 45, and his two kids, uh, 13 and 9, yeah. before killing himself. So it's such a twisted twisted story that comes out of a twisted movie um yeah. there's a lot of stuff happened around the filming of it there's all kinds of what the, they the, saw super well, the, deaths, the deaths too you know there was a lot of deaths that they mentioned that were just sort of like people just people's families members dying um there was uh jack mc how do you pronounce his name mcgowan mcgowan yeah. that played that played burke denning 
um, you know, he died right after the film of influenza. So it's like just crazy stuff like that, you know. They're like poltergeist. People start dropping dead in that movie too. Yeah. yeah. Weird stuff. You never know. I mean, I found the interesting thing. Not, not, not knowing. So. I found the interesting thing about the film is that it is a almost it's almost a word for word of the book, which I found it is. Interesting. Yeah. Um, we all three of us have watched the director's cut of The Exorcist, so we, you know, we're comparing what we're what we read to the the um, director's cut that came out in the '90s. So that's what we're um, comparing it to. But I thought it was quite interesting in this documentary that you mentioned earlier that a lot of the films that developed because I always had a problem with the film with um, the Chris and Reagan relationship. There wasn't a lot there. It kind of just jumps into Reagan getting falling ill and later being coming out to be possession. But they did do all that filming for the scenes where they're going around um, Washington DC together. And unfortunately they wanted to put it back in, but the sound was missing. And there's no way, there's no way they could bring the actresses back to redub it because, well, they're a lot older now. Right. Sort of thing. But there's, but there was, it was quite nice that they kept a lot of the things in. I mean, and there's another scene that they do keep in, they did the backing down the stairwell where he's, she's like a crab down the stairs. Yeah, that was my undoing. <laughs> that that one scene was my undoing. Well, and it, it was such a weird moment, too, because you didn't expect it, because I forget what they're talking about. Like they're her on the phone, they're talking. talking, and all of a sudden you see her coming down the no, stairs. No, I thought the assistant was like there and showed the look on the assistant's face, and she's like, what? And then she's like, oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, the, that, that's my undoing. Well, the interesting thing in the book, they do have Reagan you know, slithering Horror. around like a snake, and they did film that as well. But unfortunately, they couldn't. They didn't have. They couldn't find the right footage to actually blend it into the film because some of the negatives were a bit damaged. So that was quite interesting. Oh, so, I would have yeah. loved that. Well, yeah. not really loved it, but I would have forced myself to watch. Let's put it that. Way. But I also sit there and say through CGI. Um, because they were able when they re brought out the film again and with the director's cut, they were able to use certain things because they were able to get rid of the strings that held Reagan upside down and they were able to get those out. And there's things that they did added. They a lot more subliminal stuff in here. Like you'll notice, like, you know, when Chris goes into the kitchen, there'll be a subliminal um, face on the above the stove and things like that were, were added for the, the director's cut. So that's quite interesting. But um, the only thing I can say about Exodus is the film really is Ellen Brunson's clothing is fucking ugly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that silver dress or whatever the fuck it was. Her, her gown, her evening gown when she's at the, the you know, the, her party. Yeah. That wasn't I mean, even retro. I don't even think they wore that shit back then. You for retro, well, you know. Era. Look at Ellen Bernstein's career. And this is going from everything she did from the 70s all up into Requiem for a Dream, which she's fantastic in. I don't think she ever dressed decently. She always had ugly clothing. She does. She does. I don't know who dresses her. That's, that you fire the stylist. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that um, but there's, there's some weird things in the film. Like, like you know, this is, this is one of these things where, you know, Holly... Hollywood always has difficulty when it pre- when it presents itself, and I think that you do get this in the film. Was like, it opens up um, Chris when we get to the Chris McNeil character, Ellen Bernstein's character. We're basically she's shooting this movie, and she's getting ready, and she's trying to prep her things, and you know they're trying to get her makeup. She's no, 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 I'm in the character, get her out of the way, and then she go, then they go to film this this scene for the film. They show the filming of it, and you're thinking, this looks like a really shitty movie. It's up there with like. That, that Broadway play that um, John Travolta does is staying alive. It's like, who the hell is going to see this show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, show or, or that Showgirls <laughs> one, you know, was a, you know, they do that. Um, they go, they show the show of Showgirls, like, you know, this is what they've been practicing for. She's going to be the lead. And it's like, and then you see the show, it's like, who the hell is going to pay money to that? And this is what this movie that Chris McNeil's filming, like, you know, and they're like, oh, we can't hear your diction. It's like, you know, they're going to have to overdub because everyone's like screaming over everyone else. Yeah. Like, yeah. Doubting out of this megaphone. You're thinking, what kind of movie is she making? And it's sort of this weird moment, too, where she, for, uh, uh, Damien first sees her, but there's no, you're kind of like, is it just passing by? And he just happens. Like, it looks like he's, he was jogging, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, it was weird. No, I think he was just walking by because he's up, he's in his um, collar. 
He's he's got his. Did he have his collar on? Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and when I and this 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 is where this becomes a bit weird, because she's filming this scene and she's and apparently you know she's you know she can't let the makeup person disturb her so because she's in the thought of the characters. I guess she's probably method acting. Good luck to her. <laughs> <laughs> but she, you know, she's really so critical. Crazy. Jesus. She doesn't even have. A, she doesn't even have a dialogue. She has like f- three lines. Like, what are you practicing for? <laughs> you know, she she runs at the staff. She's got her megaphone and everyone's screaming at her. And then later on, she said she asked about the priest that walked by in the background when this film that she's filming. And you're like, how in the hell did she notice this one priest out of this whole? I know. She was in the zone. <laughs> yeah. She, so felt, that- she felt his holiness. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to feel his holiness. <laughs> He wanted a holy mess of the film. <laughs> Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> but I, I always have problems with that side of it. And another thing I always have problems with is like, um, she has this great big party, which is in the book, which is also in the film. Reagan comes down, pees on the floor, looks at this guy who we've never seen before and says, you're going to die up there. And it's only in the book that I realized that... It's an answer. I, well, I realized who, who actually who she's talking about because for the longest time, I couldn't picture who this guy was in the film. I Because I, I, I never connected that Burt Denning, the director, who looks like a Roman Polanski ripoff. Yeah. And I, that that was Burt Denning. I, could, I never figured that out in the film. It's only through the book now I, that I know there was a I did, that out the window. No, he was, was always drunk and she was always trying to find him a cab, you know? She, no, she, but it was also like, I get what you're saying because even you don't see the death. It's all, you know, it's all explained to you no, that someone, yeah. fell, you know, someone fell out the window and went down and it's a name. So my mind associated it with that person because I, when she said, you're going to die up there, I thought, well, oh, wait, that's a guy who died. And then I was like, wait, who, wait. For whatever that, reason, I, think I, thought, I didn't have that problem. <laughs> I don't know why, you know, but then well, again, I was sitting there, we were talking about earlier about, you know, Apollo 13 went up in 70, wrote the book yeah. in 71, so maybe there was some kind of, I don't know, reference. I mean, but, but, there, but, there's, yeah. but there's that other thing as well, because this is this is another reason being, it's like, because you got Chris McNeil, she's an actress, what caliber she is, we're not quite sure, but there's a scene where, <laughs> you know, in the beginning of the movie, where she puts ragging to bed, and apparently, because we have that, uh, and she's there. I'm going to take you around Washington, D.C. tomorrow. We'll spend the day together. Right. Going, Can I have a pony? We'll talk yeah. about that. So you yeah. got that whole thing going on. And then she goes, um, she goes, she goes, you can bring Bert Denning if you like. Right? So you right. Like, and she goes, oh, no, he's just friends. There's nothing romantically interested in us. So so when you see this guy, I assume that was Bert Denning, so that must be the guy that, that Chris is dating. Yeah. But no, Burt Dennings is that ugly toad, toad of a man who's sitting there and shouting off Nazi um, <laughs> references <laughs> to the references to the keeper. So that's the reason why I was always confused because I thought, well, if, you know, if Ellen Bernstein, you know, if Reagan thinks that Ellen Bernstein's dating someone, there's going to be this handsome guy in the in his, col- in his corduroy suit, I guess that's what's yeah. called, corduroy suit. God forbid the 70s. You got the priest but, um, and the, you know, So that's so. why I was always confused. I'm, I'm glad that I read the book because it actually cleared the situation up. And yeah. Denny is more of a force in the book. And in the movie, he's kind of like an afterthought. Yeah. Like, I yeah. mean, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of, that's one thing we can all agree upon, that a lot of the characters are afterthoughts. So you don't really get anything of the assistant right. or the housekeeper or the you know handy yeah. all those characters get just completely removed from the movie and it's, it's sort of sad yeah especially the psychic you know i thought that was that i would have loved, loved, loved for her to be in that because the scene in the book is so it, it, it's like you know the psychic is knows something really bad is going on but isn't kind of like um hey i think your daughter's possessed she's just kind of playing coy like oh you know yeah, this is something here, you know, <laughs> and and she kind of alludes to something's going on, and it, it keeps the mystery going when she goes to the book and things like that. But it, I feel like that opportunity to not include that character in this film would have made it would have gave more breadth to the story. It would have, I agree. And as, as you're saying, I mean, the house, the, the housekeeper, the groundskeeper, and Sharon, the secretary, they do disappear. Yeah. I mean, Sharon, you see Sharon a bit more running up and down stairs, but overall... <laughs> Terrified. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, overall, I mean, they're not really there. 
mean, he, he's, he's like, like it's happening like, again. Why are you leaving me here with this girl? There's just no way there has to be. <laughs> I didn't sign up for this shit. <laughs> Get me the hell out of here. I know. Well, even like the Chris McNeil characters is like, she's she goes out to do God knows what. I can't remember what she's going out to do, but you know, she doesn't. Well, while she's out, you know, when Burt Dennings goes, does his tumble down the staircase, um, you know, she leaves him with the 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 secretary. Which I, mean, I don't. I think she's a secretary slash au pair slash nanny. Maybe I don't know. I mean, this. Yeah, the assistant with many different hats on. We're not quite sure what exactly she does, except yeah. every once in a while she gets a typewriter out and types a couple things. But um, you know, but so Chris Chris goes out, and then it's up to the um, the secretary nanny au pair person Sharon to go out and get medication. And thinking, why didn't the mom just pick up the medication on the way there? Yeah, you know, and then, and then yeah. person goes, why did you leave my daughter alone? Well, she needed her medication. It's like. And it's almost like Sharon, Sharon wanted to say, well, you weren't going to fucking do it, were you? <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I've never been you doing anything on your own. You don't ask me to do it. <laughs> Precisely. You had me wiping her butt, for God's sakes, at the time. <laughs> and and, and that, that leads me back to, like, oh, I left it with Bert Benning, which I was assuming is this nice. It's wrong. I thought that's fine. Uh, but now that he realizes the old, you know, the, the racist drunk who basically has never gotten over <laughs> Not that, that really wants her mom too. <laughs> you know, the Holocaust is very much in live inside um, Bert Denny. Yeah. Over it. So, I mean, you know, fair play to him, but, you know, I don't know. So, I mean, the, the, I guess it's, it's kind of weird because it's almost like the movie is set up a certain way. You have the Iraq sequence in the, every time I watch this movie, I forget about that Iraq sequence. And, I as I will now state that the good thing about shooting in Iraq and no matter what century that you're shooting in, it never changes. So that's probably the nope. most important part <laughs> yeah, of the film. Exactly. Well, Even they were just. Out. I think they'd at least try to tie that in with a movie and Father Marin. They did. Well, yeah, I think I it's like oh, we got we got this fantastic actor Max Vaxauden. You know, we got, yeah. we got him for three weeks worth of filming. We might as well get the most out of him. You know, and, and that's good. Iraq an job on, They did an amazing job on his makeup and aging him because yeah. he they he, did. He wasn't he, and he. The thing I do like is that in the in the book they make Marin so fragile that I would have turned that man away the moment I opened that door. I'd be like, nope, <laughs> you're not helping me. <laughs> Because in the movie, he's not fragile. He's just kind of like focused. The moment he in, he comes in the house, he looks up and he's like, I'm going to get to work. Meanwhile, you know, in the book, Marin's like barely crutching along, you know, and can I, can I get some tea? And he's just, you know, it's like, uh, this guy's going to die before he can get up the stairs. Like, <laughs> Well, I just didn't say that. <laughs> True. <laughs> I mean, gran- granny and those old um, sweetie – Tweety Young cartoons was a lot stronger than Father Marin. Yeah, <laughs> serious, right? Well, even like I said, Mox Van Sido, he did a really good job. What was he like in his thirties when he did this? And they made him look like he was. Yeah, he looked like he was sixty seven. Well, I have to yeah. say that this is the most phenomenal makeup I've ever seen on aging anyone. And yeah. I've seen some really ropey aging makeup on actors through the years. Yeah. I mean, if anyone's ever seen For the Boys of Bette Midler, oh, yeah. that's probably the worst aging makeup. I just I mean, she came out looking like she had a moon head on. I don't know what they were doing with her. <laughs> but, uh, but this, I mean, this was, I mean, I always thought that Max Van Seiden was old. It's, only, yeah. it's yeah. only after watching the transformation of the documentary, I was like, Christ almighty. And in, and in bright um, and in bright natural lighting as well, it stood up. And that's yeah. the real yeah. test sort of thing. But I think I mean the movie is uh, the movie is a classic, and I do understand where it is. I have to sit there and say though the mo- unfortunately I've seen a lot of piss taking of this film through the years. So there are a lot of scenes that are actually spoiled for me because I just start laughing um, very unwarrantedly because you know I do laugh. You're a at, sick ticket. That's why. Well, I do. No, laugh. Because, I do. You know that like scary movie too like opens up with the whole the whole scene when Father Marin gets there, and it's just from that yeah. point on it's the most ridiculous like slapstick that you ever see. Like it's Reagan, sure that was like, funny. It's they start so beating funny. the shit out of her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It is. And you do, and you know, unfortunately, but I have to sit there and say that what does stand up that's the most horrifying part of this, and apparently, this is the reason my audiences were dry. They weren't driving out and 
um, droves fainting in the aisles and all this stuff. It wasn't for the simple, it wasn't her masturbating with the cross or the bloody menstrual blood on, on yeah. her thing or the throwing. No, but don't forget the lick me, Mer. That was pretty intense. But what, what actually drove, what actually made the um, public and the audiences freak out, which I still says it does me the most, is when Reagan's going for medical examinations. Yeah. Like, Oh, the MRI, uh, whatever that was. Well, when they have to put that stent thing in, like I personally can't even, I can't even look at my own blood, but the moment you see that and it like spurts out, I literally got like, that that was, that messed me up too. I don't like that shit. I I hate that shit. So when you read these things about like people fainting in the aisles and everyone freaking out, the the original of Exorcist, this is what they were freaking out about, is that that Mm -hmm. part scene. And I always assumed it was all the possession part of it. That's what made audience freak out the most, but it was actually that. When I sit there and say watching it, it still holds quite a odd fascination. I mean, I I work in a hospital. I see a lot of medical procedures, but the way he filmed it was the the stark contrast, the bright lighting, everything's very in your face and yeah clinical very well in this very yeah very clinical yeah i do think but there are there are some interesting moments in the film there are some things that do it does work i mean it does set itself up as a hollywood film the way everything is carried through i mean everything's very much you can tell that it's a hollywood studio film for the way that's filmed at least the bedroom and all that other stuff because you know that's where yeah. the main stuff was staged and that was worthy of your big encore was and they had to keep it freezing in there too that poor girl you know yeah, she's she, like 11 12 years old she was freezing her butt off making this movie well then she wasn't like the the way they had the rigging in there she wasn't completely strapped into the like metal plate that holds her and again how effed up this freaking director was like she was like thrashing around and she's like stop and she was literally like saying stop like stop and he's like keep going keep going keep rolling yeah <laughs> that's a good actress she's so poor, good <laughs> poor girl's back is getting broken and she's like ah this is great keep going <laughs> she's really method linda <laughs> she's, really method. she's great for her age <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do have to wonder about Linda Blair's parents. I, every, no time shit. I, every time I watch this, I think to myself, it's like, would, if I had a child, would I let them film this film? And knowing how much she, she's in the middle of it all. I mean, she's, yeah. it's her. Even, yeah. even the point where, I mean, they put the, when she vomits, that's coming out of her mouth. She had to hold it in her mouth. and spit pea out. soup and oatmeal. No, but didn't they, didn't they also rig something where it taped along her mouth and they created like a separate like opening? Yeah. Yeah. When, when they got, when they got the part where they wanted um, projectile vomiting, yes. But when yeah. it was actually coming out of her mouth and pouring out of her mouth, she had to hold that in her mouth. And like, oh, and, oh, and, God. And they, she did a good projectile vomiting. I mean, she can hang out with me any Friday or Saturday. <laughs> but it's also like, can you imagine being, how, how old was she when she did this? 11. 11, 11 12, 12. Yeah. So you can imagine having to say, you 11 know. 11 to 12. She celebrated her 12th birthday with filming it. I mean, can yeah. you imagine doing lines like, your mother sucks cocks in hell? Like, you know, all these like lines. You're like, oh my God. Can you, can you, like, and usually the parent gets a script and is like, oh, you know, yeah, my child's going to do this. And you're, you're reading like, you know. Dot, you know, Reagan grabs mother's face and shoves it in her crotch. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Say, look me, my favorite part. Like that was just just the look on her face, though. That when she did that, the violence. Yeah. I mean, she just. I mean, it was a disgusting thing that she did. But I mean, I never saw that coming. Really, actually, yeah. when she grabbed Ellen. That's when she slapped her in the face. That's well, when the director slapped Ellen Burst. <laughs> Face. he actually slapped her to make that sense well no but also that scene too if i remember from the documentary is that it she actually fell back and and hurt herself yeah her back. he's like i want you to do it again and she was like uh okay and so then she did it again but he i think he originally used the first take and it was like well what the hell and it, it, he wanted to get like more up but because you know it says he chose to just push her that way and i'm like what a mess yeah, i was just wondering if there's any workman's comp on the set you know? no like, probably the, the fact that people would die in left right and center i don't think that was the case i think they're like well you made it you know <laughs> you graduated <laughs> you're in the movies now baby um, <laughs> I mean, interesting. Another interesting thing is, is that even with the, you know, let's go to the the iconic version of her masturbating with the cross. That's Linda Blair's hand. 
They still, yeah. have, I mean, if you watch the documentary, I mean, she, they got it, they got the cross in their hand and they go, okay, you pound it into a pill and they get, they got the pillow between your crotch. Right. But, you know, and the thing is, you're like, you know, nowadays, basically what you have is you have, you know, I don't know if you'd use a little person, midget. Yeah, you would, you would have a, you, you would have a stand in. So the back side of them, you'd probably get most of the, the, yeah. you get the, you get the thrust in like this, but then the out would be me. And then it go back and then me, you know, like you would flip it. Well, they, no, they made, definitely caught the, the moment. <laughs> well, they, yeah. well, they even made Linda Blair grab the guy by the crotch as well. Yeah. When he goes, the doctor, you know, that's her. And I, I, yeah. I, I mean, when you look at all that, I mean, if Linda Blair, if you're listening to this, I do love you. But <laughs> um, I have always thought she was kind of a one hit wonder. And I always, I always assumed before I watched the documentary, and I've seen this film multiple times. Right. And I always assumed that their body doubles were used and all the other stuff that we do get in Hollywood films. And I didn't realize that, you know, it's her. She's a, yeah. She was a bloody good actress. I don't know what happened when she went on to do Hell Nut and Boogie, um, Roller Boogie and other films that she unfortunately did she just never got she was just fixed into that part like some kids well, do and it's sad though too because you take a big chance on a movie in a role and you think it's going to launch you in a direction to where someone's going to take you serious as an actor but what happens is is it's like oh you played this eccentric character here's another eccentric character and here's another eccentric character and it she just got, what like, her parents thought don't you think yeah. you know it's like this well, is going to launch I, th- I think I think another I think another problem basically is this is before home video when this movie came out and people's people's beliefs probably as far as remembering people might have been quite scarred at this time I think that if you go to the movies you probably would have forgotten the actress's name and I think that if she didn't have she had to go in hiding for two or three years after this right film was. yeah the simple fact that I mean she couldn't be seen in public because people were going after her right and there were like cults going after her and or talk about it's quite Jeez. I mean the story behind the exorcist behind her and stuff like this is actually quite a lot a lot scarier than the actual yeah itself. and I think that if that didn't happen chances are I think her career could have gone differently because that means that she would have to be three years out of the public eye and by that time the world had moved on you know like any yeah. actress who you know like a, it's like a recording artist or anything even today if they don't come out with an album every year or two years People yeah. forget about them, and it's really hard for them to get back into it. Right. So, you know, because- I think that, you know, it's interesting, though, know, that I wonder if that would be the same now. If it could a young actor or actress playing this type of a role, I think of, like, the girl that's in Stranger Things. I can't think of her name now. Um, like, her playing a Reagan, she wouldn't have been – they would have been like, oh, what a great role, and now let's give you something else, right? Like, I think – it's now it's like it's different i think it's like it's more of a a piece of art versus this was very hollywood right very like shock value hollywood let's let's shock the fans you know Mm. the first of a kind which then launched other franchises to similarly do the same like you know i think of insidious think of other it's like that shock value of it's normal everyday life and then bam like you know this happens to you Mm. The, the movie is you know 45 minutes to an hour La di da, la di da da da. You know, we're going about just life, and then it literally then it's bam. Then all of a sudden, you're like in it. You know. Well, they uh, made the second one, wasn't it? The Heretic or something. Yeah. yeah. And that was just so oh god. That and the third one, just like the. Well, interestingly enough, is that the Heretic was being filmed as our um, at the same time as our next episode, The Omen, which is out right, now, right. and. Um, and they're basically they're running simultaneously and it was talked about using the people that were doing the heretic there there was talk of linda blair doing the omen at one point but she was tied in with the franchise because of her contract was still with the um studio but um i think that you know the exorcist i think that you do have i mean I think another thing what you have at this time is that you did have a lot of typecasting going on at this point in time. TV actors could never go off and do movies and movie actors would never go off and do television. And, True. and if, you, if you were, because a lot of things what happened to TV actors is because they were in people's homes week after week after week, they were never could really make that changeover to film because people will always think then like Henry Winkler was always going to be the Fonz or you know, Laverne and Shirley it was always going to be Laverne and Shirley, no matter what they did outside. Yeah. Of that. And he had a lot of this going on at that time. And, you know, you got to admit, I mean, 
for Hollywood to make a film like this was, I had a lot of balls. Because yeah, the big there, brass ones, they were on the ground. <laughs> well, there are, <laughs> things, there are things in this movie that you would not be able to get with get get over it today. You, there's no way that Hell you know. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that too. The rating system at that time was still very critical. So you, I, you wonder... You know, it had a strong how, R, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, like, how did that get through? And it's like, you know, it, I'm glad it did. I'm just saying, like, how did that get through to to get the rating that it did without going to, like, NC-17, which is, you know. Well, right. I mean, the thing is about the rating system and stuff like that is to remember is that in the 70s, it was kind of like no hold bar. So you did get some interesting films. Like, you would get... Jodie Foster coming out with the girl who lives down the uh, lane. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and she's got, she's full nudity and she's <clears> like, <throat> this is just before puberty, which you yeah. not get that. Then what happened in the eighties due to films, well, Friday the 13th mainly, but yeah. parents started like complaining about things. Too and graphic. Like, yeah. The MPAA the came on board. Teenagers when they're having sex. It was always the teenagers that were getting caught through. And well, the they were, well, what happened is the MPAA, the MPAA <laughs> came around at this time though. And what happened with the MPAA were people were like highly conservative adults who were basically very part of the Christian right and they, and, they were, and they were coming in and dictating pretty much like the Hayes Code earlier. Yeah. Yeah. What, so what you got in the 70s, and late six, well, late six, early 70s, up until the 82, 83, is that you didn't have a Hayes Code and you didn't have the, yeah. you know, the, the strict codes that are now in, you know, Hollywood films. You know, there's still a lot right. of prints that are there. You know, yeah. let's, let's put it this way. You're never going to get on with uh, penetrative sex in a Hollywood film unless they're speaking French and you call it an art film. Yeah. You know, that's still very much today. Not saying I want to see penetrative sex on TV I, or on films. I saw enough of that in Angel Heart with Lisa Bonet and Mickey Rourke. But, um, <laughs> but you know, so that's, so that's the main thing. So that's why these 70s films are very, very interesting because they, they're, you know, you do get a child actress doing her own part all the way through from point A to point B outside of a couple yeah, of... Yeah, buttresses heads in, in beds and things yeah. like that. <clears throat> Tina would not like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a bit like Psycho when you first, when people, when the, the audiences first saw Psycho, and you got to remember this is the first time they ever seen a Hollywood film depic- depicted um, violence this way with the shower yeah. scene. Yeah, the shower scene, she was naked. You know? I think she was really naked when she filmed it, wasn't she? Yeah. And- I would also say if this movie had ended where Reagan died, then, then I think there would have been a problem because it's still good triumphs, right? So God... Yeah. saves his girl and the girl you know lives and the tra- you know it's a tram versus if she would have been killed by the demon <laughs> that girl comes like, back to make terrible no, we movie. can't do that <laughs> i mean and it, you, you know nothing you need to look at let's say we're all quite horror aficionados in this you know in our podcast here and we're all very very versed in horror films and we if we take everything that we see in horror films it's very very hard to shock us in anything yeah, but yeah. Not, now now think of like the first horror film that you ever see is the exorcist that's the first thing that you ever seen yeah i agree and you know and it's a hollywood film there wasn't like some independent you know dario argento film coming out of italy or something like this this is like mm-hmm. you know top actors top director who just came off of like one of the biggest films of the, you know previous year it was the french the, you know the french connection French connection yeah i mean i could just I mean, in one way, it must have been exciting and fantastic at one time to just be like, see this kind of experience for the very first time. And, you know, and these, and, you know, and these people are seeing it in a theater. You know, you're not watching it at home. You're seeing it in a theater all the way around. Right. <laughs> so, I, I also think that had the author, again, I mentioned this before, had the author and the, you know, the director of this movie chose not to name it The Exorcist and left some sort of ambiguity to it, mm-hmm. it would have had more shock value because you're kind of, if you watch it and again, you've never seen it and you watch it, you're kind of like, what's going on? And you're like, okay, a mother and her daughter and oh, she's getting sick, you know, what's what's happening? And then when, But it might not when, have that draw though, John. No, because, because I would just say even, if, you know, back then trailers were good at making cuts and not showing yeah. everything now it's like they show you the entire movie via trailer versus back then you can cut yeah, it and that's be, true be like yeah. what's this about you know and and sort of leave it at the end where you say that you know don't try to try not to tell people the ending or to this or tell what it's about to leave it to that i'm sure that would have made even much more money because well, this is after vatican too which really you know 
Yeah. Well, see, I'm kind of wondering is because when you look at the history of The Exorcist as a book and the history of it, it's becoming a film, what you basically have before the film, before the book was published, William Peter Blatty wrote the screenplay and started shopping it around. And so I'm wondering if maybe Hollywood maybe chose the title because yeah. by, before the book even went to publish, the movie was sold and then it went to publish. And it took yeah. two years. It took two years to put everything together. But, but, the, but you know, so, the, you know, the book came out two years. I mean, the movie came out two years after the book. Yeah. And so it's just interesting that they went such with the direct approach because, you know, to I, me, to have that ambiguity would be like, well, I mean, maybe it's, that's, a, that's, I guess, more of a modern way of looking at it too, because now most films will do that too. They'll put like a weird name and you're like, what the hell is this about? And then you have to get into the film to go, oh, okay, so that's what that's about. You yeah. have to put yourself back in that time though too, because I was like five, six, and I remember it being, my mother shooed me out of the room when Walter Cronkite came on because they were talking about it on national news and they yeah. did show that one scene where they're saying the power of Christ compels you where her, her skin slits on her ankles. Yeah. That yeah. was played on, on regular CBS news. Wow. You know, so people said, because they were talking about this was the thing. I mean, yeah. this was it when it hit. So the reason why I'm, I mean, I'm thinking outside the box here. The reason why I'm wondering if maybe it was Hollywood that came up with the title, because if you look at films at this time, films are very literal in their titles. Yeah. Books, you can name things to whatever you want to name the book. And as you notice, a lot of times the, if the book title is a bit, obscure what they'll do is they'll give it a more direct title for the film and mm-hmm. that's why i'm kind of wondering maybe it was called something else the book might have been called something else and how they was like no we're going to call it the exorcist and then the publishing company goes well true if you got the holiday we're going to call that the way to connect it yeah you got to connect the two of them and where if i think if it was like you know if it was like the haunting of hill house let's say shirley jackson's the haunting of hill house and then you know five or six years pass and then some Hollywood comes on knocking your door. Okay. We're going to do the haunting where if it yeah. was, if they were doing simultaneously, it might not have been the haunting of Hill House. It might have just been the haunting. Yeah. Right. You know, or something like that. So maybe, maybe that's the reason why it's such a direct. And because yeah. if you look at other films at that time, I mean, they, you know, even, you know, Jaws, you know, or, yeah. you know, Chinatown or Bonnie and Clyde or the Star French Wars. Finish or, you know, they're yeah. very literal titles of what they yeah. are. You know, so maybe, yeah. you know, it's possible. I could be full of shit. We make yeah. ourselves off my head, but it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you made it sound good anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, Vicky, you want to start us off with the final discussion of the of the film? Okay. Um, well, my thoughts on it was, um, it was brilliant. Love it. There's really just no getting around it. You have to watch it if you like horror or even, you know, you just like the shit scared out of you every once in a while. Or if you're a recovering Catholic, this is the, this is yours. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's just, there's, it's just, it's brilliant. I mean, there's just no getting around it. I mean, the, the directing and, and the lighting and the makeup, you know, he's talking about the aging makeup, you know, on Max von Zido. I mean, it was, I didn't even know it was Max von Zido. Until yeah. I realized it was my son It didn't look like him, you know. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, if you're really into the horror genre, it, it's it's definitely in the top five. Nice, Keith. What about you? Um, I think as a milestone film in the horror genre and in a Hollywood genre, I think it's really worth seeing. I think it's it is a very good film, and I think if you have never seen it before, I think you'll find a lot. Um, to like about it it's very very good i do think i overall i think i prefer the film over the book I think, yeah me too i because i think that i think that has a lot to do with ellen bernstein's character i think that you she feels a lot more plugged into the situation than the chris mcneil in the book and i think that has to do with the actress and she you know she gave a lot of thought process to it i mean there's just one story that when they finished filming she gave um, Linda Blair this charm bracelet on it. And, the, and, and, Alan, and when the reason when Alan Bernstein asked her about the charm bracelet, the reason why Alan Bernstein wore the charm bracelet is she said this is a woman with no faith that had no faith, but she always believed in a little luck. And then the charm bracelet that she's wearing has a bunch of luck figures on it. Oh, Which means that this is an actress who brought a lot to the role that she actually thought through the role. And I'll be, I think every actor really 
you know, was fantastic in it. So yeah, I think the Exorcist mm-hmm. is a film that if you love horror films, if you love Oscar winning films yep. as well, I think it works mm-hmm. on a lot of different things. And whether you believe in the devil or not, I think that you don't have to believe in that sort of stuff to actually get enjoyment yeah. on this film. I agree. Well, I, um, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. I, um, you know, for me, it's like, I'm glad that I read the book. Um, I, I've seen the movie many times and it get, it definitely gives a different, uh, more in-depth, uh, view of the story, especially the relationships between the characters. Um, that's one thing I do think some of the characters that looked, um, in the movie, but the movie is much more straightforward. It's much more in your face. Um, the characters definitely play well off of each other as if it's, it, it's a close relationship that each of the, the actors have with one another. And it definitely translates that way. Um, I definitely think that th- the film is a precursor to many films that are out now that, you know, okay. you, if you ever want to watch uh, something that's done really well and you watch something like The Exorcist, you can see so many other films you might have seen that, oh, so that's how they did it. And that's how they did it right. You know, and that's how um, it was pulled together. But That's how it was uh, done in the olden days. Exactly. <laughs> that's how it was done. Um, and, you know, it's, it's definitely worth, I would say, both of them. You know, it's different. Each the book and the film are different from each other, but both are worth um, taking a gander. Um, before we close, I need to mention that um, I actually bought tickets to www.seatgiant.com to see Bad Out of Hell, the musical, which is now closing in London and making its way to Detroit. It's going to be on a fantastic American tour. Um, this, yeah, well, be really, this, let's check it out. Yes, it's based on the Meatloaf album written by Jim Steinman, Bad Out of Hell, and it's doing fantastic business. It left here, went over to Toronto, it's come back, it's selling as really hard to um, get seats i haven't really? been able to find seats anywhere but i was able to get them through seat giant that's www.seatgiant that's s-e-a-t-g-i-a-n-t.com and i was able to get my 20 percent discount using the ll podcast under the dis- discount code so use seat giant so you battle the hell when it comes your, to a city near you coming to the U- u.s 20 percent off that's a bargain it was like the so- scorpions in september <laughs> Today was a great day for an exorcism. Um, I mean, a podcast. In case you <laughs> forgot how to find all of our social and podcast platforms, as well as check out past episodes, become a patron, and read our reviews of books to screens and everything in between, head on over to our website at llpodcast.com. For our next podcast, which is currently posted on our website, we will be continuing the theme of the month, The Children Are Our Future where we'll be covering the film The Omen as well as Frailty. As always, we'd like to thank you for downloading, sharing, and liking the Literary License Podcast. Until next time, may the power of Christ compel you to keep listening. Bye. Bye, everybody. It burns! Oh, it burns!
Please, Amy, I'm afraid. 